So we looked at the MCMC algorithm just now in ex uh, with very little detail. So I would actually like to go back to the Markov chain example that I was doing last week, but uh, I ran out of time on. Finish that off and then then do a practical example of the MCMC and then try to get the the theory of the MCMC yeah, to you guys. So let's see how much of that we can get through today. Oh, okay. Before before that though, um, I thought I might ask answer the question: How does MCMC even relate to the topic of this course, the rare event estimation? So there are lots of ways that this being able to sample from any distribution helps, but perhaps the most relevant to what you've already been studying is this thing called improved cross entropy. So um, with the original cross entropy, you are sampling from a sequence of distributions and you're getting closer and closer to the G star distribution, which is this optimal important sampling density, uh, which is proportional to the original density uh, conditioned on the event, the rare event actually happening. But instead, if you can sample from that, that density using MCMC, you can do the following. So your improved CE has the same goal, is to look at some family of distributions and then find which one, the V star, which gets you as close as possible to the G star, the optimal. And so instead of doing multiple iterations and moving closer and closer, instead you just have uh, one iteration, you sample directly uh, from, from the G star. So this is a bit of a mistake here, that shouldn't say IID. These things won't be independent if they're from MCMC. So if you sample some identically distributed variables from the optimal important sampling density G star, and then <laughs> it's very simple, you just then choose the the V to be the one that maximizes the log likelihood of seeing that data uh, inside the family of distributions that you've chosen. So, uh, and then once you've, 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 in one step, you've fitted the absolute best, um, you found the best distribution inside your family for important sampling, then you just go ahead and do important sampling with that with that distribution. And this is so much simpler than the original cross entropy method. So even this part here, there's no likelihood ratios, uh, uh, there's no iterations doing things over and over and over again and hoping they converge or you don't have to choose a starting location. Uh, so I, this, uh, this is part of your, your quiz actually for quiz three will be to go back and redo a problem you did in quiz one, no sorry, quiz two using cross entropy and redo it using the improved cross entropy and you can see that you get the same results but with um, it'll run faster and the code will be simpler and so on. Okay so back to the specific, I made up some Markov chain to introduce some of the ideas of Markov chains and, and how they relate to MC, MC. And the chain that I, I described last week was uh, using this transition kernel. So starting at some point, uh, last point, xi minus <laughs> 1, I sample an exponentially sized jump. And then with some probability, I either add that jump or subtract that jump from my current location to get the next location. In the rules for jumping left and right, where if I was um, if I was less than minus one, then always jump right. If I was greater than one, always jump left. And then in between, uh, jump left or right with some probability, where <laughs> this region would favour going to the minus one, and this region would favour going to the plus one. So, 
the specific probability of jumping left is this thing here. And so I went I wrote some codes to do that transition. So given where we were in the past, to get a sample from the next one, Rx in R generates a new exponential random variable with the rate lambda. Here I've just put lambda is five. Probability of jumping left, that's just this thing here. And then the same rules. If it's greater than one, I'm jumping left, so the subtracts the jump size. If I'm less than minus one, I'm jumping right, so I add the jump size. Otherwise, I sample a uniform random variable, and if it's less than the probability of jumping left, then I do that. And so that that should work all fine. Let me just check that that code still runs. Yeah. And then I went through and wrote the the density, which is this is basically for some each point. Uh, the transition densities at, at a point x, it's a, a mixture distribution of uh, an exponential and a minus exponential. So I won't go through that a second time. And that, this is what they, the different transition densities look like given where you were last time. So if you started in the middle, then you have a pure Laplace distribution, which is 50% chance of going left or right, each side being exponential. And then if you're above plus one, it's just a pure exponent, negative exponential jump left. If you're below minus one, it's just a pure exponential jump right, and then some something in between those two, for those other values. <coughs> so here is that code again to make the transition. And then here is uh, the code that I'd written to vectorize the transitions. So given a vector of locations x, say I have 10 Markov chains that are running at the same time in parallel, and I want to push all 10 of them forward by one step, this is this would give me the next location for each of those 10 Markov chains. And uh, you guys noticed straight away that there was a problem with the code when I ran it, starting like the Markov chain in the state 1.5, that should be jumping left and it's actually jumping right. Uh, I found the error soon after going home, but did you guys, any of you find the error in my code that, that generated this problem? No? No, you couldn't. You have better things to do with your time outside of my class? That's uh, very surprising to me. So no, uh, the, the problem was basically that the, the function I'd just written was absolutely perfect, but I wasn't even calling that function, I was calling the previous the unvectorized function here. And so I, uh, I definitely slapped myself in the face after that, after finding that problem. And now we get the expected behavior. Okay. Let's see if we can simulate. I'll come back. Simulate the chain. So let's say we want to take a thousand Markov chains at once and we want to push them forward to the time 5000. Uh, we'll set up a matrix to store the results. So I'll just fill it with the empty values at the moment, not a number, n times r of them, and tell tell R that I want the, the rows to be n rows and it'll figure out the number of columns. And then I'll set them all to begin after transitioning, transition vectorized. I'll start them all at the point zero. See if that works. Nope. Oh, yeah, okay. Mm 
Let's uh, go back. Yeah, I'm a bit sad. My computer's going very slowly right now. Let me just see if I can <coughs> do something about that. Ah, I had a space between the less than and the error. Okay. So now, what's this showing me? <laughs> so if I look, the very first transition has been made. So each of the R Markov chains has been pushed forward one step. And so now I can just do some loop to do this over and over again for the many steps. So the end one is the X and minus once one vectorized. And so let's just check the last value if that's got anything in it. Okay. So we've simulated the Markov chain. What is what does it look like? So if we look at the we push each Markov chain forward five thousand steps. So if we look at the if we look at the result, then this is the the histogram for. After 5,000 steps, this is where the Markov chain ends up. The, the, it's, a, it's a random, uh, it's, it's random where it'll be at that point, but it's a bimodal distribution on centered around the points of minus one and plus one, which we might have been able to guess given the way that it was constructed. That it's always pushing towards those points, and when it gets close, it tries to stick around them. Uh, so, but it's always that it still has some variability. It doesn't actually converge to any particular point, it'll still keep jumping around a little bit. So, and then the other thing that we might look at is how does one sample path actually look like? So, instead of looking at one row of this, this result vector, if we look at instead one column and say where did the where did the first Markov chain go? So this is showing you time on the x-axis. So we started off at it's well, it's not showing us, but we started off at zero, and then our first jump must have been down to somewhere close to minus one. And then for the first two thousand. <coughs> Uh, jumps we we were pretty much always around minus one and uh, jump eighteen hundred where I spent a bit of time over at plus one and backwards and forwards like this. So <clears throat> this is the second markup chain we simulated. So each of these, I would say. The, this Markov chain is quickly reaching its stationary distribution, given the fact that this this histogram here on the left at time five thousand is pretty close to the stationary distribution for the Markov chain. Remember, you can start the point the chain Markov chain anywhere, push it forward in time, and then 
if you look at some large time of time equals infinity, what's the distribution at time equals infinity? That'll be the stationary distribution. But if you look at some time less than infinity, that which is also quite large, then it'll be pretty closely converging to, to that stationary distribution. So let's see what else we can look at. So the histogram is kind of a very rough tool um, for looking at distributions giving a sample. You can, there's another thing called the kernel density, density estimate, KDE, which gives you like a smoothed out version of the histogram basically. So this is what at the time 5000 is the smoothed uh, histogram showing the probability of, of the chain being in each of these points. But if we look at a different um, histogram, <laughs> if we forget about time um, time equals 5000 that we just grouped together all the points that hit between time 0 and time 5000 across each of the Markov chains and we see what is the dis what is the histogram for that thing um, that might take a bit of time to run so if the Markov chain started in its stationary distribution then these two plots would be identical because if you start in your stationary distribution mm -hmm. you're always each sample afterwards is also from the stationary distribution and so that's pretty close to what we got if, if this uh, histogram on the right here is well it's not identical to the one on the on the left uh, the one on the left is is only showing you the histogram of a, of a smaller number of values where this one is is the, the bins would be much smaller because you're looking at r times n which is 5000 times 1000 samples rather than just uh, 5000 samples but this is not true in general so let's see we know that the chain eventually sticks around the area minus one and one so if you started at zero, it would quickly get to that stationary distribution. But if we didn't know that it stayed around that area and we started our Markov chain a long way away, uh, it would look quite different. So let's do the same thing as before. Create a matrix for the results. And then what we'll do differently here is we'll say the starting value is 100 for each of them. So now at time equals 1, the mark of, most of the Markov chains are a 99 point something. So let's push these forward in time. So the end transition is based off where the chain was at time n minus 1. And then now if we plot uh, one of the sample paths the first market chain it will look quite different <laughs> so now see how this this is showing the path of this markov chain is significantly different to the previous Markov chains that we were sampling. So when we sampled uh, 
when we sampled them starting near the origin, they all pretty much just stuck around the origin. They look like this, uh, what would you call that? Like a, a, a kind of a square wave signal with some noise attached to it. But when you when you started it at instead the point uh, 100, it eventually gets there. I it's hard to see it maybe at, from this tiny plot, but after say time equals 800, it eventually gets to that same behavior of making the square wave around um, the values of minus one to one. But just this first part is just so different to the rest. And so this is this is the same thing that happens in, in Markov chain Monte Carlo. You are simulating a chain and you are choosing where to start the chain. And this has an impact. In this case, uh, if you wanted to simulate from that 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 uh, noisy square uh, distribution and you started way over at 100, these first, the first 500 points would just be totally useless to you. So what happens in, in Markov chain Monte Carlo is you, because you, you're you making this approximation that, um, you know the you know the algorithm only works if you were to let it run for an <laughs> infinite amount of time first to, to warm it up. And then once it sort of warms up, you know it's in the stationary distribution then you start sampling from there. You don't have you don't have infinite amount of time to wait, so you, you just let it run for some large period of time called the burn-in period. So you push the Markov chain forward a lot. And then you throw away those samples because you know that they're, they're useless to you. They'll actually just make your your you'll just introduce error into your estimation if you kept those samples. So here for example, if I were to try to plot this, if I threw away here the first thousand points, <laughs> no that doesn't work, sorry, that, doesn't seem... that only shows you the two points. Okay, so I can just do 1,000 to 5,000. Yeah, so now if you only, if you would, this is the same plot here, except I've thrown away the first uh, small part of the x-axis and I've just looked at the point of time after time equals 1,000. And we can say the Markov chain has now reached its stationary distribution. Okay, so let's <coughs> implement this MCMC. So again, I'll put up the algorithm. Let's sample from this distribution. So I think I put this in your quiz for this week, quiz three. So you should be able to take this code and, and use it directly for your assignment. So the the idea is we've, we've looked at this distribution before. It's a toy example looking at what's the probability that a, a standard normal takes a value which is greater than five. I mean, you can plug that in and calculate that directly, but we'll just test on that so that we can compare our answers against the true value. And so what we'll do is we'll sample from this distribution. Uh, where that happens, so the G star of X which is indicator x is greater than 5 and then the density of the original value divided through by L which is the probability that we're trying to estimate. Uh, and the way we'll do it is uh, starting at some point, <laughs> which is above the threshold 5, so we'll start the chain at say 5.01, and then we'll propose to move, uh, we'll, we'll move in jumps which are Laplace distributed, 
So this is very similar to what the the example I gave just a moment ago, which which means we'll, we'll flip a coin and with probability 50%, we'll either move left or right, and then the size will be an exponential random variable. So this is what the distribution of that Laplace uh, what the Laplace distribution PDF looks like, centered on zero. And then on the right here is the distribution of the G star, the target distribution that we're trying to sample from. Okay, so just copying across our target distribution is proportional to the indicator that X is greater than five, and then the distribution of a standard normal distribution. We want, say, a million samples, we'll start at 5.01, and then the transition kernel, the Q, that will be the PDF of a Laplace distribution. So the Q of XR, given the previous point, uh, will look like a, the PDF of a Laplace distribution with the mean of the previous point. Uh, so you can check that, that formula and, and uh, that's what that is. And we'll note though, one nice thing about this this way of sampling is that if you were to reverse the input and the output of the transition, it's symmetric, it's identical. So Q of R given, sorry, Q of XR given X R minus one is the same as Q of X R minus one given X R. So that's what I've written here. And that simplifies your equation. So here, uh, the I've got again the MCMC algorithm. The key part is this acceptance probability. So u is less than or equal to the alpha alpha thing. And if you look, um, because you have a q of x r minus one given y on the top, and on the bottom you've got a q of y given x r minus one those things cancel. So all you've got left is your acceptance probability is the ratio of the original, uh, your target density evaluated at the proposal divided by the target density evaluated at where you were one moment ago. And when you plug that in, that turns out to be this indicator y is greater than 5, e to the blah blah blah. Um, it's R minus 1 because they are random, but uh, this is random function, but it's random uh, distribution of the class. Um, I don't see the, the, yeah, so the it, relation between Laplace and the random Yeah, so the, the thing is, whenever you're going to simulate these things, the, the values aren't random anymore. So at time x is zero, we've just chosen an x zero point to start the chain. And so at time x one, we, we need to generate a Laplace distribution with the parameter of x zero. And so that thing is no longer random. We know what it is. We can just simulate directly from that. And then at time two, we know what x one is. So x one is no longer random. We can just simulate a, a Laplace distribution with that parameter. So each time we need to simulate the mu, that led to the that's one way of looking at it, yes. Or you can look at it as in you simulate a bunch of Laplace distributions centered around zero, and then each time you just add that to your current location. It gives you the same effect. And so uh, one nice thing about this, uh, this random walk sampler, it's called, when, when you have the... <coughs> The transition kernel is symmetric like this. The resulting thing is called the. Uh, I better write it down. Uh, random walk sampler. Then you can actually interpret the. This step is quite easy to interpret. Uh, normally, when you look at. this alpha thing. Uh, well, well, I remember when I first saw it, I thought, what a disgusting mess that thing is. Like, what the hell is going on? And it didn't make any intuition, intuitive sense to me whatsoever. 
um, but in the when you when the queues cancel uh, and you're just left with the density of the target at the new point and the density of the target at the last point, you actually get a really nice uh, uh, intuition. And so that's what I've tried to write on the right here. So once you've made a proposal, you actually have three scenarios. Uh, firstly, if you propose something which is not a valid point at all, so in our case, we're, we're, propo we're looking at distributions which are always, uh, we want samples which are always greater than five. So if we propose a point that's value is four or three, we're not accepting that. Every time we'll reject that point. So, and the way that happens is, if you plug in a point, say we propose y equals zero, and that's not big enough, if I look at my target, um, I'll see that this indicator will be zero. And so the numerator here will be zero, the whole thing will be zero. We'll accept it with probability zero. We'll never choose an invalid point, given that we started somewhere valid. And then after that, then it's um, another interesting thing happens. If we propose a point Y, which has a probability which is greater than where we were last time, we'll always accept that. So we'll be our mark of 10 will be moving, always moving towards, well not always, but <coughs> if it suggests moving towards a position which has greater likelihood under the target, it'll accept it. But we don't want to only move in the, that direction. The, the distribution might have some, th that we want to sample from, might have some parts which are very likely and some other parts which are not very likely. But our samples should have the right number of each. It should sample the rare, the, the rare parts of the distribution sometime. And so that's what the, sort of the magic step here is. If you propose a point Y, <laughs> which is less likely than the point that you currently are at, you don't throw it away every time, but you flip your coin and with some probability you accept a point that pushes you further away from the most likely part of your distribution. Okay, so let's see if we can get this R code working. So for R in that range, set that loop up. Beforehand, we should choose what lambda value we want, uh, where we're going to start, uh, and how many samples to take. So. And again, we'll set up a matrix which, oh sorry, a vector which stores the samples starting with our position that we've started in, we've chosen to start in. Okay, so to generate the Laplace distribution, Uh, we know that uh, we know that it takes positive and neg <laughs> negative probabilities with 50% probability. So we'll just take a uniform random variable and ask if it's less than 0.5. Okay. Call that half, and then we can say the sign of our random variable will be minus one to the power of that that random that um, coin flip. So that means with probability a half, uh, we'll get uh, a true, and then we'll, it'll be <laughs> minus one to the true, which is takes the value minus one to the one, which is minus one. And then with probability it'll be false. That evaluates as minus one to the zero, which is positive one. Well, you can stem, you can. Um, 
simulate random variables either well using you can't use the, the cumulative distribution function to, to generate random variables directly but if you can if you knew the inverse function of the cumulative density function then you just take a uniform random variable and then you just plug that into your inverse cumulative density function probably for the Laplace trans transform I could have calculated that but I, I was just too lazy to figure that out so in this case I thought I would just simulate exponentials because R can already do exponentials very easily and then just change the sign from positive to negative with probability a half it seemed a simple solution but there's many ways to skin a cat so then we say our proposal y will be where we were last time plus this random sign times an exponential random variable with rate lambda okay so what's the <laughs> acceptance probability so we've got alpha equals so I've got it written over here on the left uh, the simplified form so the indicator that y our proposal is valid is greater than 5 exponential of a half times the previous point squared subtract the proposal point squared okay and then we have if we simulate a, uni a uniform random variable and that's less than alpha then we have the magical results that the new sample is the proposed one <laughs> otherwise the new sample is exactly where we were last time probably because I made a mistake thanks <laughs> uh, so let's see if that works yes that seems to be working probably almost impossible for you to read that but the first points are 5.01, 5.01, 5.01 so these four <coughs> each uh, proposal has been rejected and then it and then finally jumps to 5.04 5.13 and the chain gets going from there so did that work? I guess is the next question <coughs> No. So that's the histogram of the X's. We can plot that against the, the density that we're trying to sample from because we can actually write that down. But for that work to work we need to rescale rescale the histogram to be like a sample density. Put in probability equals two. And then We'll make a sequence for evaluating the the true thing, the true PDF. And we'll say add the line to those points Z, and then the density is those Z which are greater than five, the density of a normal random variable divided by the normalizing constant one minus P norm of five. So it looks like it's it's working. Nope, the color is not working there. So yeah. 